Burton with Foley and Lardner, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's web conference titled Fashion and Apparel Industry Braces for Supreme Court Ruling. In this program, we will address the recent Supreme Court ruling over the Star Athletica LLC versus Varsity Brands, Inc. I'd like to take a moment to introduce our program speakers today. First, we have Laura Ganoza. Laura is a partner with Foley and Lardner in our Miami office and member of our litigation department. Laura represents clients in a wide range of complex commercial litigation matters, including but not limited to cross-border disputes, trade secrets, non-compete actions, as well as a variety of intellectual property litigation matters, including trademark, copyright, and patent infringement. Second, we have Julie McGinnis. Julie is an associate with Foley and Lardner in our Milwaukee office and member of our intellectual property department. Julie provides counsel to clients on trademark and copyright law matters, including clearance, portfolio management, prosecution, licensing, risk management, defense, and enforcement. Before I turn the program over to our presenters, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's program will last approximately one hour. We encourage you to submit written questions during the program. Please type your written questions into the Q&A widget open on the left-hand side of your screen. We will respond to written questions at the end of the program, time permitting. The webcast console you are looking at can be completely customized. You can resize or move any of the windows that you have open, including maximizing the PowerPoint presentation on your screen. If you experience technical difficulties during this presentation, please visit the web webcast help guide by clicking the help widget below the presentation window, which is designated with a question mark icon. The PowerPoint presentation will be available at our website, foley.com, in the next few days, or you can get a copy of the slides in the resource widget. As a reminder, today's program will be recorded and will also be available on the website. Foley will apply for CLE credit after the web conference, and if you, do, if you did not supply your CLE information upon request, please send an email to Megan Burton, at M-B-U-R-T-O-N at Foley.com. To be eligible for CLE, you will need to log in to On24 session and answer the polling question during the program. As a final note, those seeking Kansas, New York, and New Jersey CLE credit are required to complete the attorney affirmation form in, in addition to the polling question that will appear during the program. A five-digit code will be announced during the presentation. Please email the form to Megan Burton at mburton at foley.com immediately following the program. And now I'd like to turn the presentation over to Laura Ganoza. Thank you, Megan, and uh, thanks everybody for joining this program today, whether it's just that morning for some, afternoon for others. Um, so we here at Foley uh, with our fashion initiative have been following the Star Athletica versus Varsity Brands case that is currently pending before the Supreme Court, and that could, depending on how the court rules, have implications for the larger fashion and apparel industry. So we thought that now, after all the briefs have been filed and after oral argument took place uh, just a couple of days ago on October 31st, so everything is now before the court, we thought it'd be a good time to share some insights, thoughts, and kind of um, give some, a presentation on what, what this case is really all about and why it's so important for those of you in the fashion and apparel space. Um, but before we get into the specifics about how this case involving cheerleader uniforms can um, have greater implications to the fashion industry, I thought it's important to step back to focus on what is the real issue that is the heart of this discussion. And what is the question that the Supreme Court is tackling and of those practitioners in the fashion and apparel industry, what you grapple with, what courts have been grappling with to struggle to answer. And basically it's the following question. What is the appropriate test to determine when a feature of a useful article is protectable 
under Section 101 of the Copyright Act. And in order to answer this question, we have to start with a couple of premises, right? The first premise is that authors, uh, including fashion designers, can obtain copyright protections for all different categories of work. And one of the categories of work is pictorial, graphic, sculptural works, which includes two-dimensional and three-dimensional works. Um, so that, that's not a controversial notion. But at the same time, there's also another premise of copyright law, and that is that generally useful articles are not eligible for copyright protection. And under the Copyright Act, a useful article is defined as an article having an intrinsic utilitarian function that's not merely to portray the appearance of the article or to convey information. Well, why does this matter? This matters because in the context of, under copyright law, things like furniture, and for our purposes here today, clothing, are considered useful articles. So therefore, generally, we all know that things like, there you go, the, the chair, the um, plates, something like that, and the t-shirt. That's a useful article. And under the general notion, copyright law is not going to protect that. Well, that being said, the Copyright Act also does say that the design of a useful article shall be considered a pictorial, graphic, or sculptural work, but only under certain circumstances, right? It's only when that pictorial or graphic work can be identified separately from and is capable of existing independently of the utilitarian aspect of the article. So this is how it all combines. You have a situation where you do have a useful article, but we're going to be speaking about what happens when you have a design incorporated within that article. And so then that begs the question, when you're dealing with a piece of clothing, how do you separate the design element from the useful portion of the article of clothing? And that's what we're going to be talking about today with this background and this context. I want to throw it over to Julie so Julie can give you the case history of how this case of a cheerleading uniform and a copyright infringement case between two athletic wear companies made its way all the way up to the Supreme Court so we can tackle this issue. So Julie, why don't you, oh, okay, and see here are some of the elements, here are some of the, the uh, images of the closing designs, I guess, here. Julie, why don't you go ahead and give us some history here and put sure. this all in context with the case. Sure. Thanks, Laura, and uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. So um, as, we, as we mentioned, Star Athletica and Varsity Brands uh, design and manufacture cheerleading uniforms. Um, several years ago, Varsity Brands sued Star Athletica, uh, claiming that Star had copied uh, some of Varsity Brands' copyrighted cheerleading uniform designs. So prior to the case, Varsity Brands had obtained copyright registrations for five of the designs that were at issue in the case. These designs uh, were two-dimensional works that included a claim to various arrangements of things like stripes, chevrons, zigzags, and color blocks. Um, we have some examples um, of, those, of those works for you. Um, so you can see this is what was submitted to the Copyright Office and what the copyright registration covers. Uh, so we've got, uh, on this slide, we've got three kind of dress or top and skirt combinations that were registered. And um, we've also got uh, two tops that are sort of similar but have, uh, you know, you can see the configuration of color block, stripes, zigzags. Uh, this is what Varsity Brands is, is claiming their copyright covers. So let's also take a look at the designs, some of the designs that Varsity Brands alleges that Star Athletica copied. Here's a picture from Star Athletica's catalog of uh, some of its uh, uniforms that it offers for sale. You can compare that to what was submitted to the Copyright Office by uh, Varsity Brands. Here's another uh, example. And here's an example of the tops. 
So as you can see, the top row are photos from Star Athletica's catalog, and the bottom row is what Varsity Brands copyright registration covers. So Varsity Brands brought a lawsuit in the Western District of Tennessee. Um, the lower court, um, in, the, in those arguments, Star Athletica argued that Varsity Brands didn't have a valid copyright in these designs because they were for non-copyrightable useful articles. In other words, they were for articles of clothing and therefore Varsity Brands should not have been able to obtain a copyright in the design of that clothing. Their reasoning is that the elements of the design that constitute a pictorial, graphic, or sculptural work are not separable from the utilitarian aspect of the uniform as an article of clothing or as a cheerleading uniform. So the Western District of Tennessee held in favor of Star Athletica and held that the designs were not eligible for copyright protection. So Varsity Brands appealed to the Sixth Circuit, and on appeal, the Sixth Circuit reversed, uh, holding that the graphic designs that Varsity Brands had registered could be identified separately from and were capable of existing independently of the utilitarian aspect of a cheerleading uniform. Therefore, the court held that the designs were copyrightable subject matter. One thing to note is that in the Sixth Circuit uh, paid careful attention to the amount of deference that the court should be giving to the Copyright Office's decision to, to issue a copyright registration. The court did hold uh, that Skidmore deference applied as compared to the higher level of deference uh, under Chevron, uh, under, under the Chevron case. What that means is that the Copyright Office looked at, basically the court treated the Copyright Office's decision um, with some deference, but not a really high level of deference. The court said, this is not like rulemaking. We haven't designated the Copyright Office as a rulemaking, lawmaking, administrative body, but the Copyright Office does have specialized knowledge. So when it makes a determination to issue a copyright registration, that is entitled to some deference. So transitioning back to Laura to talk about uh, this concept of separability and what it means to be for a design to be separable from a utilitarian article. Thanks, Julie. So there's a couple of different notions that we can use to try to determine what separability is. One is this notion of physical separability. Can a feature be physically separated from the article itself? while leaving the functional utilitarian aspects of the article intact. And so this is sometimes when it's a physical separation, it's easier to decide, right? And the typical example that the copyright gives is one of these decorative hood ornaments um, on a car or vehicle, right? So you can remove that decorative design and you would not destroy the, the function of the vehicle. So in that case, it's, it's easy to do it. Just separate it. This is, this is the portion I'm seeking protection for. This is separately uh, identifiable. So that's easy when you can do it uh, based on physical separability. It becomes more difficult when you have to deal with a conceptual separability. And that is whether you can recognize the graphic element or the design element of the work, even if you can't physically separate it from the article itself. And, and even in some cases, some of these may be easier than others. For example, in, a, in the case of furniture, if you have a beautiful carving uh, etching on the back of a chair, well, in that case, even though you can't remove that etching per se, you can still separate that etching as its own separate design from the rest of the useful function of the chair. So in that kind of a case, it's, it's even easier. But when you're dealing with a garment, for example, that's where it gets tricky. And in one case, in this Giovanni fashion case out of uh, New York in the Second Circuit, a designer attempted to claim that the ornamental design of a prom dress would be entitled to protect copyright protection, saying that 
that you could separate the elements, such as the, the placement of the beads and the sequence and the patterns and where you put the tool. And that could be separately, um, you can separate that from the rest of the dress. The court said no. In this case, you can't. The, that's the whole entire function of the dress. That's what makes it the prom dress. And in this case, you can't separate those two elements. So those are, those are the two notions that we're looking at. And I'm going to throw it back to Julie so she can explain how the Sixth Circuit grappled with this issue and how it came to its decision ultimately reversing the lower court's ruling. Sure. Thanks, Laura. So the Sixth Circuit... Uh, came up with its own test for how you decide whether something is conceptually separable. Um, so first, you determine, do we have a use for our useful article? Here, we've got an article of clothing. Clothing is a useful article, easy, easy to determine. Next, you have to look at what the utilitarian aspects of that useful article are. So for example, providing a place to sit is the useful uh, utilitarian aspect of a chair. Um, once, that, once those aspects have been determined, can you identify the features that are being claimed as pictorial, graphic, or sculptural work separately from the utilitarian aspects of that article? Uh, and then you need to look at, can those features exist independently of the utilitarian aspects? So this part of the test kind of follows what the statute says. It follows what the Copyright Act says. So, what the Sixth Circuit says is that if the features of the design aren't required by the utilitarian function or they're unnecessary to the utilitarian function, then the feature is capable of existing on its own, it's conceptually separ separable, and that means that the design is eligible for copyright protection, obviously subject to other requirements like originality. Um, so in arriving at this test, the Sixth Circuit did a very comprehensive overview of a lot of the other tests that other circuits, other courts have used. We won't detail those for you, but uh, you can see there's a, a short list of the, the titles that gives you an idea of what courts, uh, what courts looked at. The point that the Sixth Circuit was making is that there are a lot of different tests and standards that courts are using. It's not necessarily a split. It's just that courts are using a lot of different mechanisms to arrive at the answer of whether or not something can be conceptually separable. So two of the cases that the court reviewed uh, in detail put these tests into action. Um, there's a case from the Second Circuit and one from the Fourth, both of which held that uh, there was a valid copyright. Uh, Chosen International, uh, the court held that there was a valid copyright in the design of a Halloween costume. The Halloween costume was made to look like a stuffed toy animal. Uh, the, the plaintiff had registered a copyright, and the court uh, upheld that copyright protection. Similarly, in Universal Furniture, the court held that the decorative elements adorning furniture, like Laura had described earlier, uh, a, for example, a, a carving on the back of a chair or on chair legs, um, those were eligible for copyright uh, for copyright protection. So what the Sixth Circuit did is it took all of this, looked at all of these different tests, and came up with its own approach, which is what I just reviewed uh, prior. So that uh, leads us closer to where we are now. So Laura, if you want to talk about uh, what's happened since the Sixth Circuit opinion. Thanks, Julie. So obviously, the Star Athletica was not too happy with that ruling. And um, they took it up with the Supreme Court. And originally, they wanted two questions to, uh, to be answered. What's the appropriate test for determining when a feature of the use for article is protected by copyright? And then they also wanted to um, uh, have it heard as to the level of deference that the Copyright Office should have. The Supreme Court did grant cert, but only on the first question. And I think this is what makes this, you know, very important for those of us who practice in this area. You know, the fact that the Supreme Court took cert of the first question means, at least we hope, that they're ready to clean up what really is a muddy water of all different tests that are out there. And hopefully, recognizing that this is all floating around, Hopefully, with the ruling, we'll get some kind of rule or they could better articulate the elements 
for how one should determine the separability of the design elements that are integrated into something like apparel. But, but we'll wait and see. The fact that they did take cert, though, does mean that maybe they don't think that it's just as simple as, oh, well, this is just like fabric designs, or it's just another two-dimensional design on something. And so maybe, maybe that can tell us something. But um, the fact that they took cert certainly means that, at least we hope, we'll get some kind of clarity so that all those tests floating around um, don't continue to burden us all. So what kind of arguments were made to the Supreme Court? And Julie, why don't you go through what Star Athletica, how, the, how they pled their case and what the arguments they made to the court? Sure. So Star Athletica is obviously urging the court to find that these, cheerleading uni these designs for cheerleading uniforms are not copyrightable. So in their Supreme Court brief, they proposed their own approach for how a court should analyze conceptual separability. First, you look at, is this work the design of a useful article? In order to determine, uh, to determine that, you need to identify what the article's inherent, essential, or natural functions are. Uh, Star Athletica suggests that the use for which an article is marketed is strong evidence of its functions. This is one of the tests that uh, other courts have used to analyze uh, the idea of utility. Um, the example that works in their favor here is that a cheerleading uniform is used to identify the wearer as a cheerleader and therefore identification of the wearer can be um, a function of the garment. Once you've determined what those functions are, then you need to consider whether a feature of the article can be recognized apart from the utilitarian aspects. Star Athletica urges that the, the the reasoning behind this would be because it would be found to be purely artistic. If, if something isn't purely artistic, um, if it can't be recognized as a unit by itself, I should say, then there's no copyright. If yes, if, if it can be recognized by itself, can the artistic feature and the useful article exist side by side? If a feature must be purely, uh, if a feature is not purely artistic, meaning um, that it advances the utility, utility of the article in some way, or if the article depends on this feature for its utilitarian function, then Star Athletica would urge that there is no copyright protection. So if a, essentially they're arguing for a bright line that a feature has to be purely artistic as applied to this utilitarian article. Um, finally, in a close case, Star Athletica urges that a court should decline to provide copyright protection if, uh, if they're unable to figure out which side of the bright line that the feature falls, falls under. So the question here is, does purely artist, this purely artistic requirement knock out a lot of the design of apparel, which may, as Star Athletica would argue, have some function in, in the garment? Um, so I'll turn it over to Laura to talk about Varsity Brands' uh, arguments that they made in response. Thanks, Julie. So Varsity Brands tries to make more simplified arguments to the court in terms of, okay, let's start with the Copyright Act. And the Copyright Act, you know, pretty much gives you a straightforward rule. Um, you know, the pictorial elements um, include 2D designs. And uh, Varsity argues, look, we've registered hundreds of original graphic designs as two-dimensional works of art with the Copyright Office over the years. And it, this is naturally inherently separable. The, trade, the Copyright Act allows for uh, 2D work to be viewed as separate from the useful article and, and provides that those elements can be entitled to copyright protection. And the fact they urge that the fact that the 2D work of art can be used not only on the actual uniform, it can be used on other things. They can put that same zigzag design on a duffel bag and they have used it on tracksuits or 
coffee mugs or other things. So they say, just looking at it very simply, the exact same elements you see on our cheerleading top, we can put it on something else. So that in and of itself proves that it's separable. And they, they also argue that the function of 2D work is typically purely decorative or communicative. And those are elements that are protectable by copyright. So they say that because of that, the elements that they've put on their clothing can be viewed as separable and should be entitled to copyright protection. And they urge that what they say Star Atlantica is trying to do is to make a bright line rule. They say, look, 2D works of art have been protected all along, and just because this 2D work is found on clothing doesn't mean that the rules should change. What Star Athletica wants to do is to create this bright line rule that just because the work of art is applied to clothing, it can never be protected. And they say that's not the proper rule that the court should adopt. So even though this case really involves cheerleader uniforms, um, it's garnered the attention of a lot of people in the fashion apparel and just the larger IP community. There have been numerous amicus briefs filed um, by several trade organizations. The CFDA, Council of Fashion Designers of America, filed, filed a brief, Fashion Law Institute. The government uh, filed an amicus brief and actually argued uh, before the Supreme Court and various law professors have also put in their two cents on what should the court do in grappling with this decision. So, Julie, why don't you talk to us about what some of the amicus have filed on behalf of the petitioner, Star Athletica? Sure. So, um, for example, uh, Public Knowledge and a group of others filed a brief in support of Star Athletica and they were really focusing on the idea that creators rely on this expectation that a useful article is available for use, that it can be adapted, reused, and improved without requiring a license from the copyright owner. And they're urging that a decision that would hold that there is copyright in these types of design elements would, would really be a hindrance to people who are uh, creating useful articles. They also urge that the appearance of clothing should be found to be utilitarian on sort of this First Amendment grounds, um, arguing that fashion is tied to ideas of speech and association, and that therefore that is a utilitarian function that shouldn't be protected by copyright, um, and that creators should be free to use those elements um, in expressing um, expressing speech. Um, so we also have a, a brief that was filed by a couple of law professors um, that looks less at the policy reasons why and looks more at the function of clothing. Um, they urge that clothing designs are actually dual nature. They've got an expressive function and they've also got a utilitarian function. So the professors say that when the design aspects have simultaneously expressive and functional roles, the design elements can't be separated from the useful article and therefore shouldn't be eligible for copyright protection. So as you can see, the, the, the amicus briefs that were filed in support of Star Athletica have both policy reasons and try, trying to explain why the design has utilitarian function. A number of briefs were also filed in support of Varsity Brands, and I'll let Laura talk a little bit about those. Thanks, Julie. So, of course, you have professors on one side, and just like experts, I guess, you get your experts on one side, your professors on one side. We have professors on the other side that uh, were supporting Varsity Brands position. And one of the arguments that they made is that you really have to understand what it means when you say utilitarian. And they have a much more limited uh, definition than what Star Athletica wants to provide. They 
want it to be limited to the mechanical or practical usefulness of the article. They're saying that Star Athletica's view that if it's useful that in the way that serves an aesthetic decorative function, then it cannot, uh, it cannot be protected. These professors are saying, well, just because the function that it serves aesthetically is to make a woman feel or look slimmer or make someone look more attractive, those are not the kinds of functions that uh, prohibit copyright protection. They're saying that Star Athletica's view of utilitarian is way too broad. They would propose a test that protects the design of a useful article if it's not dictated by or necessary for that function or for, or for that purpose. They would do that rather than excluding protection if it serves, if the design element serves any useful function at all, which is what they argue that Star Athletica wants to do. Another uh, amicus brief that was filed was from the CFDA, and they submitted, you know, this very impassioned brief about how it's so important for the Supreme Court to recognize that um, the importance of the design industry in the United States and that um, given the technical innovations like 3D printing or the fact that you can take a photograph of a dress on a runway one day on Fashion Week and that's sent over to China or another factory, another manufacturing facility, and in you know, less than 24 hours, you have a knockoff already coming and being sold, in many cases, even before the original. Um, you know, they basically are saying, you know, we have to put some kind of protections in place. And what was interesting was that the CFDA really focused a lot of their attention on the emerging designers and how a, a ruling that would limit the already limited copyright protection that designers get in the U.S. would really um, harm the emerging designers, especially because uh, piracy is such a problem that, that threatens the industry. And another brief along those similar lines was the Fashion Law Institute. And uh, they, the same thing, the worry about this unfettered copying that while the copyright laws are there to promote innovation and you don't want to stifle that at the same time unfettered copying does not go to to that goal they also mentioned that the US lags behind the protections for design rights and um, that's especially true in this area when you compare the US laws to what you can find in Europe or in other places in the world and they urge the court to adopt a flexible standard, not a bright line rule, um, which is what Star Athletica seems to want. So with all these briefs in hand, the Supreme Court held oral arguments on October 31st, and we were all, at least I was expecting the Supreme Court to really get into the nitty gritty, to start asking questions about what are the different types of tests, how are they applied, what elements work, what elements don't work. Um, what was remarkable, at least to me, was that the Supreme Court really did not delve into those issues during this oral argument. Um, they seem to have broader questions about um, you know, the scope of copyright in general. And they were especially interested in knowing how this case compared to other instances and um, other cases where design rights were determined one way or another. So we're going to go over some of the key points that were discussed in oral argument. And these are the three main issues that came out. They really wanted to understand what is the utility of a cheerleading uniform. They also wanted to understand how this case was different from other cases, and they brought up uh, things like uh, camouflage design and in other, other cases where a design of uh, a T-shirt, for example, was decided. 
And they were also really grappling with how this decision would implicate ultimately what a copyright owner is um, ultimately able to protect and what they can stop somebody else from doing. Those seemed to be the areas that they were most interested in getting some um, answers to. So let's start with the first question that they focused on, which is what is the utility of a cheerleading uniform? And Julie, why don't you talk about some of the ways that Star Athletica tried to answer that question for the Supreme Court? Sure. So Star Athletica is ur urging that a major function of the design elements of these cheerleading uniforms is that they create an optical illusion. So they allow somebody to see the person who is wearing the cheerleading uniform different than they already are. And this specific arrangement of the way that the zigzags and the chevrons and the stripes are placed has slimming effects um, that could be uh, making someone look smaller, taller, um, more curvy or less curvy, basically creating an optical illusion. So the example that was given is the Stella McCartney dress that was worn by Kate Winslet. You can see that on your screen uh, in two different versions. Basically, you've got these black panels on the sides that are placed there in a way that is intended to make Kate Winslet look slimmer than she already is. So Star Athletica is urging that the designs in these cheerleading uniforms have that same intent. They're placed the way they are because they make the cheerleader look better. So Laura, what did Varsity Brands say in response to that? Well, first I just have to say I love the fact that um, the way Kate Winslet looks in a dress and the slimming effects of a dress was an actual topic of discussion before the Supreme Court. That's one of the reason I love fashion law, the fact that that was even discussed. But uh, putting, that, putting that to the side, a Varsity Brand's answer is, well, you can't really have a rule that says just because something makes you look better or different, you can't have copyright protection. That doesn't make it, that doesn't make it utilitarian for that reason. And they use the example of, you know, fine art or rugs in the design, in the interior design world, right? No one would say that a painting um, would not be entitled to copyright protection, but sometimes where you put, a, you put a painting in a wall, it could make the room definitely look bigger. Sometimes it could make the room look larger. Same with a rug. And those no one would dispute would be entitled to copyright protection. And another thing that came up, you know, some of the justices were wondering if, if you take Star Athletica's view that the, if, if the design in any way changes the appearance of the wearer and you make that something that is functional to the point you can't get protection, how are you going to determine that? And aren't you going to, it's going to be up to some kind of subjective judgment as to what this piece of clothing does for the wearer, which doesn't seem like it'd be a very workable or practical test. So the next area where the court really questioned the uh, parties on was the comparison of the, this design to a design such as a camouflage design. And Julie, why don't you discuss what Star Athletica's uh, views were with respect to camouflage? Sure. So Star Athletica is saying camouflage is a great example of how uh, this design has utility because it creates this optical illusion. So when we're talking about a cheerleading uniform or a Stella McCartney dress, the optical illusion is that it makes the wearer look better. Well, we also have utility in camouflage. Camouflage is intended to make the person who's wearing the camouflage blend in to the wearer's environment. So Star Athletica would urge that camouflage has utility and it shouldn't be protected by copyright because it creates this optical illusion and that is the inherent function of the camouflage. Um, as Laura mentioned, the, the government did have a chance to argue in this case and uh, Laura can, can talk about the government's response uh, to the court's questions about 
camouflage and how that plays here. Right. So the government, the government was really on the on the side of let's um, affirm the lower court's decision. So it was on the the side of varsity brands in that sense. And the government pointed out that the actual design of the copyright, the pattern itself, could be eligible for copyright protection, although maybe thinner than others. And it only becomes an issue if the cop if the camouflage design itself is doing something to the garment that um, makes it function a certain way so that it would be inappropriate for somebody else, let's say another maker of a military uniform, not to be able to use that and come to that same function. So the government basically says, well, you can still have certain protections. You just have to see how far it is and what that camouflage pattern does and how far it goes to do something that is truly a functional element of, of the article. And so another issue that came up, and Julie, you can tell us how Star Athletica dealt with this, is, you know, this question of, well, if the designs are that way because it identifies you as a cheerleader. So isn't that a function of this uniform? Julie, what was Star Athletica's answer to that? Sure. And so Star Athletica says that identifi identification as a cheerleader is a function of the garment, of this particular garment. Um, what Star Athletica is doing here could lead to um, separating kind of your, your standard fashion that any particular person might wear and garments that, are, that have a more specific function, a cheerleading uniform. You can imagine any other type of of uniform or, um, for example, going back to the Halloween costumes. The idea that there's this some sort of identifying function. So Justice Ginsburg raised the point that, you know, hey, the Copyright Act says that, you know, conveying information doesn't make an article useful. So if you're conveying information that the wearer is a cheerleader, how is that a useful function? So Star Athletica responded and said, Identification is different than conveying information. What the Copyright Act is talking about when it says conveying information doesn't make an article useful, they're talking about facts, figures, um, data as information, not identification. Who is the person that's wearing this garment? So a way to look at this is if you take away all of these stripes and chevrons, all you've got left is sort of a, a white dress or a white top. And if you've just got this white dress, how does it identify the person who is wearing it as a cheerleader? You need the zigzags and the stripes and the color blocks, and you need them placed in the particular ways so that other people who are viewing the cheerleader wearing the uniform know that the wearer is a cheerleader. So um, both varsity brands and the government had a response to that. So Laura, how did how did they respond? Well, varsity brands' view was just because it identifies you as a cheerleader, that's something that is not um, prohibited or, or meant to be a function under the Copyright Act. So they said the identification is is not the same as conveying information. But even if it were, their point is that the stripes, chevrons, the way they use the color blocking wasn't essential to identify the cheerleader. Um, the varsity brand says you can be a cheerleader without that and that, in fact, Star Athletica sells uniforms that don't necessarily include that and they're still cheerleading uniforms. Another way of looking at it is that, you know, if, if these designs were essential to identify um, to identify a cheerleader, well, if you put it in a lunchbox, it's not going to make the lunchbox a cheerleader uniform. Uh, so in that sense, it's not essential for that function either. And the government threw its own two cents in there as well and said, well, the manner in which the zigzags are used and the chevrons, that's an expressive element. That's how the designer chose to express themselves and that is something fundamentally that the trademark uh, the excuse me the copyright office 
does protect. So that's how that's how that side dealt with that. And another issue that the Supreme Court wanted to raise was what is what about fabric designs? Is this case like a fabric design where I think one of the justices even said, well, we all agree that fabric designs are entitled to copyright protection, right? And I think the answer was yes. So what did the court want? Um, how did the different parties deal with the comparison to fabric designs? Julie, what did Star Athletica say? So Star Athletica is trying to differentiate this case from the cases that are about fabric design. They're saying this is a, a two-dimensional graphic design that is applied to a piece of, uh, that, you know, is, is applied to this piece of clothing. It's not a, di a fabric design. The reasoning that Star Athletica gave is that a fabric design works anywhere, no matter where you put it. It doesn't have the same utilitarian function that this arrangement of stripes and chevrons, for example. Their reasoning is that when you print, um, when you print your fabric design, you've got your piece of fabric. Um, it doesn't matter whether that piece of fabric is um, on the sleeve, on the skirt. It doesn't matter where that where that fabric is the design is still the same. And so they're urging that there's a big difference in taking a printed piece of fabric and applying it to a useful dress design that it is, you know, the cut and shape of the dress. There's a difference in the design elements on that fabric. Um, and so they're really trying to distance, uh, distance the idea that these stripes and chevrons and color blocks are just like a design that is printed onto a piece of fabric. And obviously, Varsity Brands um, ha had a different response. Laura, what so, did they say? Right. So they want to say, no, no, it's just the same, and you should rule in the same way and um, give us the protection that we're entitled to because it's the same. And in another case that the court was interested in was uh, this design of a tuxedo design on a t-shirt. And Justice Kagan pointed out, and this, is, this came up in the um, brief filed by the government, um, and she asked, well, why isn't this just like that case where this design that you see on this t-shirt uh, was entitled to copyright protection? Julie, what did Star Athletica say to that? So they're saying there's no function here. We're just put we all we're doing is putting a design on the T-shirt. Um, so these cheerleading uniforms that are at issue in this case are a lot different than just applying this graphic to the front of the T-shirt. So Star Athletica is not disputing that applying a piece of artwork to the front of a T-shirt um, would uh, you know would would be eligible for copyright protection. They're saying our case is different. These stripes, these chevrons, the way that they're applied to the garment, that's different than just slapping a graphic on the front of a t-shirt. Um, and obviously the the government thought differently. Right. More they want to they make say. it exactly. They want to make it as close to that one as possible and say, well it it's the same and we're the varsity brands would be entitled to copyright protection for that. Now, another area that the court was grappling with is, okay, assume you win varsity brands. Um, what are you going to prevent someone else from doing? They were very concerned with the scope of what a ruling in varsity brands' favor would mean in terms of uh, pursuing a, a copyright infringement case, it seems. And so, Julie, what did Star Athletica say to that? So Star Athletica is saying that copyright in the design doesn't prevent, can't be used to prevent someone from making the useful article that's depicted in the design. So in other words, in their position here, the Varsity Brands copyright in the 2D artwork, the 2D design of these cheerleading uniforms doesn't prevent someone from making the cheerleading uniform itself. Um, maybe it prevents them from printing it out and, and putting it in a frame on the wall or applying it to a different useful article. But 
Star Athletic is urging that a copyright owner can't use their copyright to prevent somebody from making the useful article. Of course, this all hinges on Star Athletica's argument that the design is useful, and therefore you can't uh, prevent someone from using the useful utilitarian aspects of the design um, to make the article that's depicted in that in that design. And Laura, what did Varsity Brands say in response? Well, obviously, Varsity Brands' view is that if you say that the copyright owner only has protections um, with respect to certain media and not others, and that goes against with goes against with what the copyright of the Copyright Act actually gives a copyright owner a right to do. The copyright owner has the right to make copies of or embody the designs into any other kind of media. And that Varsity Brands' view is and a piece of clothing shouldn't be any different. And it urges the Supreme Court, don't make a bright line rule that says, well, you cannot transfer these elements to a, a, a piece of clothing and thereby, um, you know, not have the protection for that just because it's clothing. So at this point, I think I have to hand it over to Megan for one second so that uh, those of you who want CLE credit can get it. So Megan. Thank you, Laura. At this time, I'm going to read the CLE code for this program. If you are in need of CLE credit today, please enter the five-digit code into the polling question on the screen after it's announced and press the submit button. The code is RLCB8. Again, that's the letter R as in Robert, the letter L as in lunch, the letter C as in cat, the letter B as in Bobby, and the number eight. Again, if you're seeking CLE credit for this session, please complete the polling question by entering the code that was just announced. The polling question will remain open briefly. For those seeking Kansas, New York, and New Jersey CLE credit, in addition to the polling question, you will need to complete the attorney affirmation form and return it immediately following the program. A copy of the form can be found in the resource widget. At this time, the polling question is now closed, and I would like to return the program back to our speakers. Thanks, Megan. So having had all this argument before the Supreme Court, you know, something that became very apparent to me in reading the transcript is that the Supreme Court, while all those technical elements of usefulness and and is it utilitarian in the function, they have some very practical implications that they're thinking about. And um, interestingly, Justice Sotomayor, one of the things that she said is, well, you know, basically you're dealing with, you want to try to kill the knockoff industry. She said, you tried to do it with trademarks, you tried to do it with patents, and now you're trying to use copyright to kill the knockoff industry. She did say, I don't know if that's a bad thing, um, but, you know, the, she is recognizing the practical implications of this. And it's interesting, Justice Breyer also expressed some skepticism. You know, he made the point that for, you know, more than 100 years, the fashion industry hasn't enjoyed copyright protection. And he was concerned that as a practical matter, if suddenly there are greater protections and he, they rule that dresses can be copyrightable, for example, they're concerned that that'll double the price of women's clothing and it'll open the floodgates to uh, a bunch of different lawsuits and says, you know, I fear any good designer or any lawyer out there can take any dress and say that, uh, take a picture of it and say, okay, I'm going to sue somebody else that has a dress that looks just like this. So they are grappling with the practical considerations that, um, you know, are going to result from, from this cheerleading case. But unfortunately, from the, the questions that were asked, we really, we have no way of knowing at this point where they're going to go. And I think we're just already in anticipating a ruling. I thought that we'd actually have a little more direction as to where the court was leaning. But after my review of the transcript, I really didn't see a, a fine line 
or a clear direction going one way or another. Um, so, Julie, what are your other thoughts on kind of what's next here and what we should um, be anticipating? Sure. So, uh, as you said, Laura, there, we don't really know what's, what the court's going to do. We didn't get a real good sense of that from oral arguments. So, uh, that makes it even more important to pay attention to what this ruling is and exactly what it says. Um, we think that based on what the court talked about in oral arguments, that there's a couple ways that they could come out on this. Um, it could be a very narrow r ruling that really gets to the utility, utility of a cheerleading uniform. If that's the case, that might not apply to other apparel that doesn't have those same types of functions like a cheerleading uniform does in Star Athletica's argument. Um, they could announce a, a very concrete test, a more bright line rule for clothing design or for this idea of conceptual separability in general. Um, that would either give us a bright line rule or maybe a very good standard uh, from which to start from. Um, either way, uh, whatever happens, it could have a substantial impact on the fashion industry as a whole. Um, whether it's a narrow or broad ruling, obviously um, need to pay close attention to what the court says about the utilitarian function of designs on a garment and, and, and how that can inform our process for uh, possibly protecting those design elements uh, under copyright in the future. Um, so, Laura, uh, we're going to be keeping a close watch on this, obviously. So, um, right. what do you yeah. what do you expect here? So, what we'll definitely do is that um, the when the ruling comes out, you can expect probably a follow up webinar to this one where hopefully uh, we'll, we'll get some direction. But in any case, what we'll do is see what this, really, what this ruling really will do. And hopefully we'll be able to talk about practical implications of, of that. And um, we will you know, have a more uh, robust discussion on those. So until then, I hope you all enjoyed this. I hope you all found it useful. And now you have the background so that when we do get a ruling, um, you'll know what it's all about. And so keep in, uh, we'll make sure to uh, keep you posted and, and look out for the next webinar once we, once we get a ruling. Thank you, everyone. Thank you both. Um, we invite you to contact any of today's speakers if you have additional questions or would like more information on their particular topic. This wraps up our web conference today. Just a reminder, today's program is being recorded and will be available on Foley's website in the next few days. If you have any questions regarding CLE for this program, please contact me, Megan Burton, at mburton at foley.com. At the conclusion of this program, a questionnaire will appear. Please take a minute or two to give us your feedback about the presentation. It is important to us to know your thoughts and help us shape our program going forward. Thank you for your participation.